I'm Jackson Neal. You're listening to In on 97.3 FM. Little news came across the line yesterday regarding Colin Kaepernick. Another update in this ongoing saga that started way back in the preseason of last year. And this time it's involving the Baltimore Ravens and if they will sign the star if they will sign the quarterback. And the Ravens made a statement yesterday saying that their owner Steve Biscotti is not holding back a signing of the quarterback. And it's just another update in what has been an offseason and about a couple weeks now filled of will the Baltimore Ravens sign this quarterback. And it's been dominating the news, people constantly talking about it. We're talking about it here. And in my opinion, this is, this is just another reason why the Baltimore Ravens should not sign this quarterback. Is because at the end of the day, he, he does have some talent. I will give him that. He's impressive on the field. But he's going to be the backup quarterback behind Joe Flacco. And do you really want your backup quarterback to be generating this many headlines where people are incessantly talking about it? Not just even if he's not just that you signed him, but if you will. These are headlining stories online, across the internet, across newspapers, asking if you if you will sign this one player. So in my opinion, I don't understand why you would go for a player like this as your backup quarterback. I fully agree with you, but you know I think that um, the thought behind the rate, the thought process behind Joe or um, John Harbaugh is that when the Ravens have the offensive coordinator now that was with Colin Kaepernick his rookie year and his sophomore year when they made um, the Super Bowl. So, you know, I think the, the Ravens' train of thought is, you know, if they if he's working with a, this offensive coordinator, can he, you know, calm down and actually, you know, make it to the top again? But like you said, you know, Joe Flacco will be out for three to six weeks. You know, back injuries are very touch and go, and they're not something that you can predict. So, um, you know, but the Ravens also have Ryan Malley you know he is a he is a good quarterback he he's not a playoff quarterback but he he can get them you know somewhere that I think they want to be for the season my, my exactly my question is also is where would uh, Colin Kaepernick he's a solid quarterback but just the distraction he just the, the distractions that he has on the field yeah. um bringing in Ryan Mallet back solid backup quarterback and I look at the Baltimore Ravens They've had a solid, they have a good history recently of developing these QBs. Joe Flacco turned him into a Super Bowl winner. Tyrod Taylor, you've seen what he's doing with the, what he's done with the Buffalo Bills, where this isn't a team that's in dire need of a quarterback. And I, there are some teams I would say that, you know, maybe you look at uh, getting Colin Kaepernick. But for a team that already has a solid QB, that already has that position figured out, I don't see where the need for bringing in a distraction like this is. It's very similar to the Tim Tebow situation, where there's just so much, there was so much attention focused on this one player that didn't make that much of a difference. Is there, would you even say there's a team that you would consider? I don't think that there is, you know, I just think if the Ravens were to sign him, they would only sign him for a year contract just because Joe's hurt. You know, I don't think they could really sign him for longer because he wouldn't be that efficient. Um, but I think we should take some callers or go to our 30-second 30, uh, 30 update with Will Dirksen. Thank you very much, Peyton. In baseball news, the Pirates lost to the Reds 5-2 to yesterday. Rookie Jesse Winkler hit the go-ahead home run in the seventh inning off recently acquired bucko Joaquin Benoit. According to TripLive.com, Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger recently told the Pittsburgh Press that Martavis Bryant has, quote, paid his dues. The NFL still has not fully reinstated Bryant to arrive at Steelers camp. Good news for all the other teams in the NHL. Nashville center Mike Fisher yesterday announced he's calling it quits. Fisher yesterday announced his accomplishments include 276 goals and leading the Preds to their only Stanley Cup Finals thus far. This update was brought to you by the movie Detroit in theaters tomorrow. Our next update's at 10 o'clock. For Peyton Wolf, my name's Will Dirksen. Thank you very much. And now we're going to take some callers. Um, I think we want to know what team do you think that Colin Kaepernick would actually fit on? Yeah, I definitely think there is. There has to be at least one team out there. And it looks like we have a caller coming in right now. It's going to be uh, Steve from Kennett Square. Steve, what, what's your thoughts on this? Hi, um, I'm Jake. I'm calling from Philly. And I think that Colin Kaepernick would be the best fit. On the Ravens, I think that Colin Kaepernick, uh, I think he would fit well. I mean, Joe Flacco going down with a back injury, I think that his best fit would be on the Ravens. Uh, they need they need somebody as a backup if they want to be a playoff quarterback, and I think that uh, 
give it the best fit. But is he worth the distraction? Um, <clears throat> I think if the, the Ravens want to uh, play off uh, contention this year, I think that he is worth the distraction. Even though he brings a ton of publicity, I think that it'll be worth it all in the end if they make the playoffs. <laughs> Do you do you think he would fit in um, in the demographics of Baltimore? How do you think he would fit in with the city itself? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? How do you think he would fit in the city himself? You know, the demographics of Baltimore and the people there. Um, I think he'd fit in fine. I mean, maybe maybe the fans would have a little bit of struggle, but I think that it'd be worth it all in the end if he wanted to go there. Well, thank you, Jake, for calling into middays here on ninety-seven three. I still don't see where he fits in with this Baltimore Ravens team. Where, if you already have this good quarterback, where do, where does he come into where does he come into play? Now we have our second caller here from Pittsburgh. Hello, welcome to Middays on ninety-seven point three. Hey, my name's Will. I'm calling from Pittsburgh. Uh, I actually think Kaepernick would be a good fit on the Seahawks because they're known for giving you know players who normally have had troubles in the past a second chance. And I think the Seahawks could use a backup for Russell Wilson. Ever since Wilson became the starter, they have not really established who the backup's going to be. And for my boy, they've had some troubles with his team was. You know, but Wilson is just so good coming from Wisconsin, and I think he's just a, such a strong starter, starter, and he's led them to a Super Bowl. So how do you think that you can handle that? Wilson could handle the Kaepernick signing? Yeah. It's just going to be another thing for Russell Wilson. I mean, he's used to being under pressure, and I think it would be a good asset for Seahawks to land Kaepernick because Kaepernick used to play him twice a year when he was with the Niners. Right. I think that's an interesting point there, uh, bringing up the Seahawks. You just saw um, Richard Sherman actually make some comments just the other day about uh, Colin Kaepernick and saying that if he that if he thinks Kaepernick can put some of this uh, protest now to the side recently, he think he he thinks he could be a good NFL quarterback. Now we're getting Glenn calling into the show. I think you 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 and get your thing ready. Hmm? Glenn, you're on air. <laughs> Hi, listen, I think you guys are crazy. You keep talking about a distraction. What the heck is the distraction you're talking about? Well, you, you see constant media attention. Everyone's talking about if they'll even sign him. He hasn't even had an official contract yet. It's going to be constant media attention for about two days, and then everybody will get used to it. You remember when Mike Vick came to the Eagles? Everybody said it was going to be a distraction, and it proved it was nothing after a couple of days. Kaepernick could help this team. Yeah, but he doesn't, he doesn't have the talent that Michael Vick had. He's not going to be able to put in a season like Michael Vick did in that uh, shining season he had with the Eagles. But he's coming in as a backup, and he's a pretty good backup. Listen, he had what last year? 20 touchdowns, 6 interceptions? That's pretty good for any quarterback. Yeah, but he didn't even have a 60% completion percentage, so... Ah, you guys are crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. All right, there was, there was Glenn there from Norristown, Pennsylvania. So... I just think that he would be way too much of a distraction. You know, the the people of Baltimore have been through so many things, and, you know, Colin Kaepernick, um, I think, possibly single-handedly burned down the city of Baltimore, and I think that's why, you know, Stephen Biscotti was rejecting him at first. And um, there's just so many things that we – that he could do um, – in Baltimore, and it's going to be very interesting to see where he goes, don't you think, Jackson? I think it is interesting. I like that Seattle point. We're going to start to head to break here on 97.3. You're listening to Middays here on 97.3. Okay. First of all, somebody told me I was... Good morning, everyone. Welcome to JW Sports Talk. Alongside Jake, Jake Arnoldy, my name is Will Dirksen. Thank you very much for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about uh, injured receivers that have been going down in the NFL training camp. So Alshon Jeffrey is down with a shoulder injury. Sterling Shepard is out with an ankle injury. And not to mention that Will Fuller broke his collarbone. These are all going to impact all of their respective teams in a big way because not only are they going to lose their deep threat, some of these quarterbacks are going to have to get used to not throwing to them after, you know, having them on the field for a while, their presences will certainly be missed in the locker room. What do you think about that, Jack? Uh, yeah, I definitely agree. I think that this will greatly affect the Giants. I think that Sterling Shepard, with not having him out and missing m the majority of the preseason, I think that will greatly affect his uh, his performance. 
And I think that um, with the Eagles losing Alshon Jeffrey, it's it seems very minor. I think that he'll be out. Maybe they don't. He's the number one wide receiver. They don't want to risk him. They don't want to. They don't want him to get injured greatly. So I think they'll just take him out for the first game, and then they'll go from there. What are your thoughts on Will Fuller and how Deshaun Watson? Because he needs to get established into the league right away with a deep threat. What are your thoughts about Fuller's injury? Yeah, that'll definitely hurt them too. Um, Deshaun Watson, him coming up. Um, you know, Will Fuller breaking his collarbone, that's not an easy injury to come back from. Uh, no. it'll be, he'll be out for, uh, a couple weeks. That'll be maybe even a couple months, but that'll be hard. And hopefully he'll make a, com- a strong comeback. Do you think any, or if possible, all of these players will be able to suit up and play for their respective teams by week one, of the NFL season? Uh, Alshon Jeffrey, yes, I definitely think he'll be back by week one. Um, I think that Will Fuller... I don't know. He could maybe be back week two, week three, but we'll see if he's back by week one. And then Sterling Shepard, I I think he'll also be back by week one. Out of the three receivers that we talked about, who would you say has the biggest hole to fill with their team? The Eagles, the Texans, or the Giants? Who has the biggest hole to fill in terms of making up for those receptions? Um... I think it's I think it's going to be on the Texans. I think you know I mean they still they have DeAndre Hopkins obviously, but Will Fuller that's like you said a deep threat. And with Deshaun Watson coming up and fighting for a quarterback spot, that's a that's a tough guy to lose. I mean, with the Eagles you have Torrey Smith who's a deep threat, and you're losing Alshon Jeffrey, and then Jordan Matthews. It's only a preseason game too. We're not talking season. And then obviously with the Giants, they have one of the best receiving cores in the league. In terms of what you think as the injuries how long should it be before Jeffrey comes back like two weeks three weeks something like that I'm thinking more maybe just miss they want to give him a rest for week one of the preseason and send him out for Green Bay I mean he's in no rush I mean he's got four weeks to recover and it's it's it shouldn't be that big of a deal that's got to be good news for Carson Wentz because you want him to grow you need to give him weapons you need to give him a good offensive line too oh yeah definitely they went out and did that this offseason in free agency they went out and got him two two amazing wide receivers they got him uh, a big power running back in Legarrette Blunt. They got him. <clears throat> they got him another a veteran offensive lineman in Chance Warmack. I mean, they got him everything that he'll need to succeed. Yeah, definitely. especially in today's NFL. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts about how Eli Manning's going to react to Shepard's injury? Has he commented about it since then? Um, I haven't heard anything about him commenting about it, but I mean, obviously, it's a it's a big loss, and he does still have Brandon Marshall. On, Odell Beckham Jr. are two of the tier, two of the top wide receivers in the NFL. So, yeah, we'll see how this plays out. Let's go to Peyton Napoliello with our sports update. Peyton, what do you have for us today? Hi, I'm Peyton Napoliello with your J&W sports update. As you guys said, Giants wideout Sterling Shepard was carted off the field in tears yesterday after a non-contact ankle injury. Head coach Ben McAdoo said that he's optimistic that it is just a bad sprain, though. Shepard wasn't the only receiver to go down yesterday as Texans deep threat Will Fuller broke his collarbone in practice. In basketball news, the Cleveland Cavaliers are still struggling to get in touch with guard Kyrie Irving. According to ESPN, there have been six teams who have made an offer to the Cavs for Irving. Those teams include the Spurs, Clippers, Suns, Timberwolves, Knicks, and Heat. And lastly, the Baltimore Ravens have expressed interest into quarterback Colin Kaepernick. GM Ozzie Newsom had this to say. We are going through a process, and we have not made a decision yet. It'll be interesting to see if the Ravens decide to bring in Kaepernick. I'm Peyton Napoliello, and this has been your J&W Sports Update. Thank you, Peyton. Do you have a question for him, Jack? Um, for no. the listeners. Oh yeah. Um, I think that. Um, we want to know your thoughts on how do you feel about these injuries? How do you think these will affect these three teams in these injuries? Yeah. Let's hope we get callers soon. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you give out the number? And in case you're wondering, folks, the number Jake, the, the number, number is six one zero three one four six four. Very good. Six one zero three one four six four three six. Come on, callers. Oh, here's our, here's our first caller from Bloomsfield, New Jersey. Hi, you're on with Sports Talk Radio. Hey, hey guys, thanks for uh, getting me on. I just want to talk about all the injuries, like you guys are talking about. I still think that Giants 
have a solid chance to win the NFC East, even if this Sterling Shepard injury lingers a little bit. I think that uh, the Giants have enough enough weapons offensively to, to still carry their way and win the NFC East. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that they do have a good shot, and Sterling Shepard's not out that long. I think that he does have a good. The Giants do have a good chance of winning the NFC East. I completely agree with you, one hundred percent. The only issue would be if Shepard goes down. That's got to put more pressure on whoever will likely start at running back because now they're going to have to mix up the offense a little bit more. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree with both of you guys. Thank you. Thanks for getting me on. I- Thank you. No problem. Going back off of that, what does this mean for the... Looks like we have another caller. We do have another caller. Hey, you're on with Sports Talk Radio. Yeah, how come you guys haven't mentioned the best team in the division, which is the Cowboys? I hear all this talk about the Giants. We're no good receivers, but Des Bryant. How come you're not talking about him? If you look at it, Des Bryant's already made a name for himself, and he keep in mind, he hasn't been hurt throughout most of his career. He's Unfortunately, he's fortunately been the been one of the ca- most productive receivers in the league. The one exception being when he tore his ACL. What are your thoughts, Jake? Yeah, I definitely agree with that. He hasn't been injured as lot, and I know with Dak Prescott, they'll the Cowboys will definitely have a good season this year. But there's also talk about their sophomore slump, which I don't know. We'll see this year how it plays out. No, no, we do not hate the Cowboys. They're just not a front topic issue in the world of sports right now. They've got everything going for them. They don't have any obstacles right now. Once they get an obstacle, this division race is going to get much more interesting. So who's going to win the division? Um, I personally think the Giants are going to win the division, but the, the Cowboys also have a wide receiver in Lucky Whitehead. that They just had all that uh, drama go down with him uh, at a... At a Nightclub. So, I mean, we'll see. The Cowboys, I mean, they also lost two offensive linemen, so we'll see how it plays out this year for them, too. But I think I think the Ca- or the, the Giants are the front runners for the NFC East right now. What about the other guy? What does he think? I actually agree with him about the Giants. I think they made a big step in the offseason by adding Brandon Marshall. I also think that that's going to take some load off of Odell Beckham. And their defense, if you ask me, is better than the Cowboys. Don't give the Cowboys defense any credit, though. They killed it last year. They came up clutch, and they were able to reach the divisional round, which was a very nice accomplishment. All right, I think you're crazy, but thanks, guys. All right, thanks for calling (laughs) in. Thank you for calling in. What are your thoughts on the Cowboys? Um... I think they're uh, a fairly good team, but I think the Giants are the front runners for this one. <laughs> well, that'll do it for us here on JW Sports Talk. Thank you very much for tuning in, everyone. Good night. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ben and Peyton Show. I'm Ben Curtis alongside Peyton Napoliello on 106.3 FM and a lot to talk about today. But the Baltimore Ravens were so, so close to doing the correct thing and signing a serviceable backup in Colin Kaepernick, the man who has created so much controversy. But the thing is, he's a decent backup quarterback. He's never going to be Tom Brady. He was not that in college, and he wasn't that when he was doing well with the San Francisco 49ers. But what he is, is a backup who is healthy, unlike the current backup that Baltimore has right now in Ryan Mallett. And he's a guy who you know can step in and do the job to keep a team in a game. The most important thing, write this down, everybody, the most important thing in building a team is winning the division and winning the Super Bowl. Baltimore should not care about anything else other than whether or not Colin Kaepernick can help the the Baltimore Ravens offense score touchdowns. I do not care if he takes a knee during the National Anthem, and in fact, more power to him. It should show role models that it's okay to take a stand for what you believe in. But I personally think that the Baltimore Ravens need a backup quarterback right now. Joe Flacco's not healthy. Ryan Mallett's not healthy. And they're signing all sorts of journeymen who are nearly as good as Kaepernick to try to fill that gaping void. So I personally think that the Baltimore Ravens need to sign Colin Kaepernick about yesterday. Peyton, tell me I'm right. You're wrong, Ben. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to tell you you're right. You're completely wrong in my opinion. I think that Colin Kaepernick right now isn't in the league because of the fact that 
he isn't putting up good numbers these past few seasons. It's not that he's taking a knee. Many people don't have a problem with him taking a knee. Many people have a problem with him taking a knee as well. But if you look at his numbers the past few years, they are nothing special whatsoever. And sure, you could say that he brought the San Francisco 49ers to his Super Bowl. But his best season, all he did was throw 21 touchdowns. That's not that great. And if for your backup quarterback to then also cause a distraction that Colin Kaepernick will, I don't think it's worth signing it if I am the Baltimore Ravens, and I would not be signing Colin Kaepernick if I were in Harbar shoes. Well, right now, the Ravens don't need Matthew Stafford to stand in the pocket and be a gunslinger. They don't need Peyton Manning to throw 55 touchdowns. They don't need someone to put up incredible numbers because... Frankly, Kaepernick won't get that many touches once Joe Flacco comes back in, and that's perfectly fine. But they need someone who can put up decent numbers as a starter in the NFL. And part of the reason why the numbers for Kaepernick haven't been great is the 49ers went 2-14 and last year. They were a really, really bad team, and I think numbers are a lot more uh, dependent on your fellow teammates, especially in the NFL as a quarterback, than a lot of people think. Uh- but that's also where I'm going to disagree with you as well, because if he is as good of a quarterback as you were saying, he's going to make players around him better. And I look at that Baltimore Ravens offense, and it doesn't scream they have a bunch of amazing offensive players on that team. I'm saying if you throw Colin Kaepernick into that offense right now, I don't see weapons for him. I don't see that many weapons. And Joe Flacco is able to create players around him, make them better. I don't see Colin Kaepernick doing that same thing. And why would you want to bring him in if he's going to be that much of a distraction just to be your backup quarterback? Because he's a healthy quarterback who started games in the NFL. Ryan Mallett is not healthy as the backup. If Mallett was healthy, fine. Then you have a starting quarterback and Flacco is hurt. Mallett jumps in, and then when Flacco gets back healthy, that's your depth chart. Flacco and Mallett, one and two. But Ryan Mallett's not healthy, and when he's been healthy, he's been really, really bad with the Ravens. Kaepernick hasn't been much better. The only thing Kaepernick has going for him is that he led the 49ers to the Super Bowl, and that honestly was because of that defense. That defense led them to the Super Bowl. I don't think Kaepernick had anything to do with that. Well, we're going to cut that off now with a lot more to get to, but Noah Jaffe has our sports radio update. No- Noah? Uh, Noah Jaffe with the Sports Radio Update. Phils took a big loss last night in Anaheim. Mike Trout, C.J. Cron, and Caleb Cowart leading to the loss 7-0. The Phils are last in the NL East. Eagles continue training camp at the NovaCare Complex. Alshon Jeffrey is still on the sidelines for his injury. F- Philadelphia 76ers received the highest offseason grade. This is what Markel Fultz had to say about that. I think the 76ers are going to make the playoffs. Well, it's too early to call yet, but... I think so. I'm Noah Jaffe with the Sports Radio Update. Back to you. Head on down to Sonny's Famous Cheesesteaks. Looking for a classic Philadelphia cheesesteak? Head on down to Sonny's. Tell them Ben and Peyton sent you for 20% off Sonny's Famous Cheesesteaks. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Ben and Peyton. We are going to set up some questions now. We want to hear your take on this Colin Kaepernick situation. If you were the Baltimore Ravens, would you bring in Kaepernick? You know Ben and I's take now. So it is always interesting to hear what you guys have to say. So, Ben, back to what we were talking about here. Oh, our number is 862-596-8185. That's 862-596-8185. Please join in on the conversation. Ben, back to what we were talking about here. Do you really believe that Kaepernick is the Ravens' option? He's the, he's he's their best possible option right now because I'm looking in free agency and I could I, I think that there's better better options out there for him. Like who? I would take Fitzpatrick before I would take Kaepernick. Kaepernick has far more of an upside at this point. Ryan Fitzpatrick is a guy who can hold a clipboard, but I don't think that Fitzpatrick's better. We're gonna take our first caller. It's Jim from Philly. Jim, what's going on? Jim, you're on the air. If I was the Baltimore Ravens, I would absolutely not sign Colin Kaepernick. If there's one thing I do not want in a backup quarterback, it's for him to be a distraction. If there's one thing that Colin Kaepernick is, it's a distraction. Ben, I'll let you kind of comment on that because I I agree with him here. Well, Jim, thanks for uh, calling, first of all. I think that a big reason why Kaepernick was a distraction in San Francisco was the fact that they were so bad. There wasn't else much to talk about in San Francisco. With a 2-14, and you're not going to be breaking down the win last night because there probably wasn't one. I think that if Kaepernick is able to get on a winning team, then he's just a piece of that winning team no more. 
Yeah, but there's still Kaepernick definitely no no matter where he goes, he could go to New England and he would still, without a doubt, be one of the main talking points for that team. And I just don't think it's worth it with how average Kaepernick is. But who's going to play quarterback for the Ravens until somebody gets healthy, Jim? Jim's gone. <laughs> uh, but I I agree with Jim. I think that when when we uh, when we look at it, the distraction is too much. There there's really no need to to do this to bring him in for for what it's gonna for what it's gonna br- bring to the table in Baltimore. It's gonna be such a distraction. We have one. We have another caller here from. Konsokin, Pennsylvania. It's, it's, it's Aubrey. Hello, hello. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Oh, well, oh, we've lost we've Aubrey. Lost our we lost caller. I, th- I think that a greater point here is that what kind of precedent does this set that a guy who's ex- exercising his constitutional rights gets blackballed by the NFL? I don't think that he's that it's because he's exercising his constitutional rights. Like I said before, I think it's because of the numbers that he put up the past few seasons. I mean, six touchdowns in 2015 is nothing special whatsoever. We're going to go back to the phone lines here. We have another caller. Hello. Thanks for joining the show. Uh, yeah. Um, if I was the Baltimore Ravens, I would no doubt about it take Colin Kaepernick. I mean, listen, I know he's had a few bad years, but, I mean, the coaching staff, um, you know, for the 49ers has not been good. You know, think about it this way. He led a team to the Super Bowl, okay? I think that the Ravens should definitely take him, and he'd be a great backup quarterback with Joe Flacco. Well, I'm very glad that we have a sensible caller. Thanks for calling in. I agree with you. And going back to what Peyton was saying before, the reason that I'm saying that they should sign him is because he has better numbers than the journeymen who they're hiring right now. I'm not saying he's going to be a starter, and I think uh, what you said was very true as well, that the Ravens need to sign him because he's another option. Well, you could say that he had better numbers than Ryan Mallett, who who is their other option right now. But Ryan Mallett hasn't hasn't played as much as Colin Kaepernick has, and the only reason Kaepernick's played is because he was, frankly, on the worst team in the NFL the past few seasons. I said five minutes ago that if Ryan Mallett is in, then he should be the number two. There's so much that we could talk about. We could talk about this all day, and I'm sure that we will. We, we have one final caller that we're going to bring in here. Glenn, what's going on? You guys are crazy. Why is that? Because you keep saying there's going to be a distraction. What's the big distraction? If the guy can play, the guy can play. Well, the big distraction is that every headline, every media outlet is going to be covering what's going to be going on with your backup quarterback, whether he's taking a knee, what he's doing, everything. Every post game interview, they're gonna to want to hear what he wants to say about him taking a knee. It... That's gonna be for about a day. You know, I, if you guys remember when the Eagles signed Mike Vick, everybody said it's gonna be a distraction. The first day there were fifty protesters. The next day there were twenty. The next day there were five. That's yeah, Michael Vick was able to play though, in my opinion. He can play. All right, thanks for the call. Michael Vick was able to play though, in my opinion. That's all the time that we have though for today. You were listening to the Ben and Peyton show. Thanks for listening. All right. Welcome back to Sixers at Six, your sports talk radio show for the 76ers at 6 o'clock. I'm Tyler Katz along with my co-host Mason Cole. Today we're going to be talking about whether the Philadelphia 76ers are going to make the playoffs this year, and I think absolutely not a chance. You see the Philadelphia 76ers first-round draft picks. First of all, in the past four years, They've had three first overall draft picks, Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, and Markel Fultz. Ben Simmons still has not played a game in the 76ers uniform, and Markel Fultz had a sprained ankle in the summer league, no less. The 76ers have had no luck with their first round draft picks at all, with Jaleel Okafor in 2015 being the third overall pick and not getting anywhere himself. And not to mention the 76ers last year, with a god awful 28 and 54 <laughs> record, they, I don't see them improving from that 28 and 54 record to making the playoffs. Considering a 500 team in Miami going 41 and 41 still didn't make the playoffs. I just don't see the 76ers improving to that level to make the playoffs this year. So Mason, I'm going to hand this off to you. Mm-hmm. Do you think the 76ers are going to make the playoffs? Which 
is not likely, or <laughs> do you think that a well, miracle? Well, I mean, obviously we can't, you know, predict really what injuries are going to happen. But if healthy, I think the 76ers have a strong chance of making the playoffs. I mean, if you look at the Eastern Conference, basically like the bottom half of the playoff picture is kind of wide open last year. The Bulls were in there. Jimmy Butler is now a Minnesota Timberwolf, so I don't think the Bulls are going to make it. The Pacers, you know, were the seventh seed. Paul George, now a Oklahoma City Thunder, so they're probably not going to make it. I definitely think that a team with, you know, some talent like Philly has a chance of slipping into, you know, one of the lower seeds, like an eighth seed or seventh seed. Um, obviously, they have to stay healthy. Joel Embiid, when healthy, is one of the best players in the Eastern Conference. Ben Simmons, I think, is going to be really good. Markel Fultz, you know, he needs to stay healthy. Dario Saric, he's all, you know, he's pretty good. Um, I like, you know, I like the, uh, I like the players that the Sixers added in the postseason. They added some good veterans like J.J. Redick. I think with the talent that the Sixers have, and in a conference as bad as the Eastern Conference, I think that there is a, you know, good chance that they could, you know, slip into the bottom of the East. Well, let's take a look at the Sixers' projected starting lineup mm -hmm. for the upcoming season. At point guard, we have Markel Fultz. At shooting guard, we have Timothy Luwawu. Cabarro. <laughs> at small forward, we have Robert Covington. Power forward, Ben Simmons. And at center, Joel Embiid. Do you think with this projected starting five that the Sixers can rocket past teams that were finished ahead of them, such as Charlotte, New York, and even the Orlando Magic? Yes. Well, the starting lineup will be different. Uh, it. Pff, where was your starting lineup at? The starting lineup will probably be Foltz and then Timothy whatever his name is at the shooting guard, and then Ben Simmons, small forward, Saric at the power forward, Joel Embiid at the center. And I think that's enough talent in the East to, you know, get to, you know, one of the lower seeds. The East is really bad. The East is garbage. There's not a lot of, you know, talent in the East. A lot of it's going out West. So I think, you know, if they can all, if they can all stay healthy, which is a big if, I think that there's a good chance that they could make it to the playoffs. I just think, you know, with how bad the East is, I think that they can get past teams like Orlando and, you know, Charlotte and teams like that. All right, with that, we're going to pass it on to Caden Vincent with our Sports Talk update. All right, Phils took a big loss last night, held by Mike Trout, CJ Crone, and Caleb Coward all hitting home runs. The Phils are currently last in the NL East and may not even make the playoffs once again. The Eagles continued training camp as Alshon Jeffrey, still on the sideline with his injury, there was, and there was pre first preseason game in next week. The 76ers have received the highest offseason grade with the addition of Markel Fultz, some Philadelphians are saying play, and other rookies and young stars. That's all for Sports Update. I'm Caden Vincent. Thank you, Caden. Now we're going to head in head into our phone lines. If you'd like to call into Sixers at 6, the number is 862-546-8185. So anyway, as we continue talking about this, it seems as bad as historically bad as the Orlando Magic and Charlotte's been dropping, and New York was supposed to have a super team last year, but had a record of 31-51 and 51 last year. I just don't see Philadelphia, with that projected starting five, going past teams like that, even with yeah. some upgrades in multiple cities that finished above them, not only making the playoffs, but also teams that didn't make the playoffs. You're having a call again. <laughs> My phone didn't ring. <laughs> well, uh... I do think, I mean, I really like Joel Embiid. I think Joel Embiid, you know, obviously is a great center. Oh, we have a call here from New Jersey. And from Bloomfield, New Jersey, you're on the air. What do you think? Hey, guys, I just, I don't know what you guys are talking about. You know, Timothy, well, we don't care about He's a great player, but uh, are you guys forgetting that the Sixers signed J.J. Reddick? I mean, he's going to be in the starting lineup. J.J. Reddick, you know, he's going to be in the starting lineup right away, so. Yeah, J.J. Redick definitely, yeah. J.J. Redick probably will start. And that's another, you know, another veteran like J.J. Redick obviously is going to help out a young team like the Sixers. Uh, you know, having shooters around, especially with a lot of good inside players like Joel Embiid, having players to kick out to like J.J. Redick, I think that'll help a lot. Do but do you think that a veteran such as J.J. Redick, who is getting up in age, is going to be able to combat these new young players that are rising in the ranks? 
such as Jimmy Butler, who's now in the Western Conference, so the 76ers will only have to face him twice. But still, these young talents, do you think that J.J. Redick, with his age, is going to be able to help the 76ers propel past these booming talents in other cities? I do. I think that's going to help the team out big time. I think, you know, having all these young players surrounded by a veteran has playoff experience. I think that's a great thing for the young players. J.J. Reddick's not going to be there, you know, for the entire process because when everybody's ready to be superstars, he'll probably be gone. But, you know, to kind of get their, get their foot in the water in the playoffs, I think that, you know, J.J. Reddick's a perfect guy to help them do that. Yeah, and J.J. Reddick, with, you know, his age, he is older, but, I mean, still... He's a decent defender, so, I mean, I still think that J.J. Reddick can help out a lot, even though he's, you know, getting up there in age. All right, well, thanks for calling in. We're going to keep moving on to our next topic, being that Will Markel Fultz, the first overall pick in this year's NBA draft, how much do you think he's going to help the 76ers propel in the season? I definitely think he's going to help out a lot. But we have another caller coming in. From Pompano Beach, Florida, welcome. You're on the air. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my call. I think that the Sixers will make the playoffs. I think mm-hmm. that that 7-8 seed is wide open after Jimmy Butler has gone to the West, Paul George has gone to the West. I think that the bottom of the East playoff picture is just waiting for a young, exciting team like Philadelphia. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the Sixers have a lot of talent. Ben Simmons, we haven't seen him play in a legit NBA game yet, but... You know, he's got great court vision, great passing ability. I think he's going to be good. Markel Fultz, I think, is going to be good. We already know that Joel Embiid, when healthy, is very good. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think with their young talent and veterans like J.J. Redick and Amir Johnson, I think that they can, you know, get into a 7th or 8th seed. You have to remember that Miami and Detroit were in the playoff picture. They still have healthy teams that haven't had a lot of losses. Miami finishing with 41 and 41 Detroit 37 and 45 mm-hmm. even though teams like the Pacers are dropping out of the east you still have to remember that Philadelphia had five teams ahead of them that yeah. still didn't make the playoffs the- yeah. well, I think that uh, Philadelphia is going to improve this year yeah. I think that looking at last year's playoff picture is necessarily the right idea yeah. especially with the record Philadelphia is going to get better on a whole lot of the teams yeah, I mean, the way the way that I look at it is, yes, they did have five teams ahead of them, and thanks for the call. They did have five teams ahead of them, but they also did not have Markel Fultz. Dar- or they didn't have Markel Fultz, they didn't have Ben Simmons, and they only had Joel Embiid for like 32 games. So it's like a completely different team now. Now we're going to get another call from Norristown, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the show. You're on the air. What do you think? I think I can't believe you guys have been yammering all day and not wanting you. Barely brought up Joel Embiid being able to play or not. I've played 31 games in three years. I mean, yeah. What, what makes me believe he's going to be healthy enough that he can play and he'll make the playoffs? I mean, I mean, you're right. He hasn't played right. All I'm saying is, is that if he's healthy, he's one of. It's a big if. If he's healthy, <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> if he's healthy. He's a great player. He can help out the Sixers a lot. And, um, you know, they still have players like Ben Simmons, Marco Fultz. Joel Embiid's great, but they still have other talent other than Joel Embiid. Well, we're going to have to... How many NBA games does he play? Uh, we're going to have to <laughs> cut you off there, as that will do it. Thank you for tuning in to Sixers at 6 o'clock, live from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Tune in every weekday, you guessed it, at 6 o'clock on 104.7. Good night, everybody. I don't know why my phone... And welcome yeah. to the CNN Show. I'm your host, Caden Vincent, with my tremendous partner, Noah Jaffe. We got a lot to talk about, and let's just jump right into it. MLB postseason predictions, and I'm just going to start it off. Los Angeles Dodgers, the hottest team in baseball right now, won nine in a row, the best record in the second half, 75-32. and 32. But, again, we also got to look at the Houston Astros, who are right behind them at 69, almost 70 wins. They're on a roll, too. Noah, I'm going to bring you into this. Right. Who okay. do you think is going to be the step up in the AL this year? Well, that's a really tough uh, question. I think that, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, what what happens in the next uh, few games. Um, I really don't know yet. It's a good question, but uh, i got to think about that one. All right, yeah, I would um, uh, sort of agree with you. Um, but as we said, the AL Central, it looks like the Indians have a two-and-a-half game lead currently. Right. The Chicago Cubs have a two-and-a-half game lead. 
Mm-hmm. Do you think the AL Central is going to be the Indians and the Cubs, or do you think it's going to be all mixed? Jim, what What do you think the AL Central, the AL Central, and the NL Central is going to be? Well, I think that it's it's going to be um, you know uh, the Indians and the Cubs again. I believe, um, but okay. it, uh, you know the Cubs, you know they've been making a bit of a comeback, and I think that ever since uh, All Star Weekend, I believe that they've been sort of starting to uh, improve their game. Yeah, they're fourteen and four to start the right. second half. And so I think that, you know, we might see them in the playoffs. We might not. But um, I think that they might be in the playoffs. I think they will prob- probably be in the playoffs. Okay. Well, for some teams that we could automatically eliminate, sorry, Philadelphia. Snagging Unfortunately. <laughs> San Diego, they have a very not a chance, basically. San Francisco, surprisingly no. No, um, yeah. The, uh, the Cincinnati Reds, probably no. And that's just the NL. But – the Milwaukee Brewers are, like I said, two and a half. The Royals are also two and a half. What about the wild card? Because the NL, it has the Arizona Diamondbacks and the Colorado Rockies. The NL the wild card is probably sealed. It's probably going to be the Rockies and the Diamondbacks. Right. My question for the AL, who's your AL wild card? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, my AL wild card, I mean, what, what, what teams really would be, you know, considered for the wild card, I, like, would you I say? guess you would. You could say um, the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees are fighting right there. But I think that you know, with the addition of Aaron Judge for the New York Yankees, I think that they could get that wild card spot. I think that um, he is, you know, a good play, a role player for the team, and I think that you know we might see him as a wild card. All right, now I'm gonna just break it off a little bit here. Uh, Aaron Judge, do we think? Because obviously. He has struck out in at least once of his last 21 games. That's right. right. Once in his last 21 games. That's crazy. And he's only hit three home runs, which is horrible compared to where he started. He's not even first anymore. Right. What's going on with Aaron Judge? Um, you know, it might be a late season pressure. You know, playoffs are coming around, and you know, he might be you know, get some pressure. Uh, I think that. You know, it's it's always coming around this time. It's always, you know, you think that you, you want to try to make the playoffs and he thinks his team could possibly, you know, make that wild card spot. So I think that he's a little bit nervous and I think that, you know, uh, he might be cracking under pressure, if you, if you don't understand what I mean. All right, and one more thing and then we'll go to a quick update. Um, The... Uh the NL, the AL West. Do you think that's sealed with Houston, like twenty one games, or do you think anyone's gonna catch them? I mean, obviously losing Carlos Correa, but they just got Francisco Lariano. Like, what do you think of the Astros right now? Oh, I think that Houston is definitely sealed into that spot. They I have? think that they are such a you know a great uh, team that you know they've just really hit it this year, and I think that they've definitely made that spot. All right, now let's go to our quick update, man. Um, Peyton Napoliello. Hi, guys. I'm Peyton Napoliello with your CNN Sports Update. Giants wideout Sterling Shepard was carted off the field in tears yesterday after a non-contact ankle injury. Head coach Ben McAdoo said that he is optimistic that it is just a bad sprain, though. Shepard wasn't the only receiver to go down yesterday as Texans deep threat Will Fuller broke his collarbone in practice. In basketball news, the Cleveland Cavaliers are still struggling to get in touch with guard Kyrie Irving. According to ESPN, there have been six teams who have made an offer to the Cavs for Irving. Those teams include the Spurs, Clippers, Suns, Timberwolves, Knicks, and Heat. And lastly, the Baltimore Ravens have expressed interest into quarterback Colin Kaepernick. GM Ozzie Newsom had this to say. We are going through a process, and we have not yet made a decision. It'll be interesting to see if the Ravens decide to bring in Kaepernick. I'm Peyton Napoliello, and this has been your CNN Sports Update, brought to you by Jim Steaks, your favorite midnight snack. Thank you very much, Peyton. We're going to take some callers now. Yeah, the number again is to call is 216-470-8303. Go ahead, use those numbers. We would love calls. But here's a little bit of a question. The Los Angeles Dodgers. Oh, actually, we got a call right now. All right, that's great. From Columbus, Ohio. You're on the air. Yes, of course, you're on it on the air. I uh, I'm just driving around listening to my car, and uh, I heard you guys talking about baseball. Yes, seems like you think you know what you're talking about, but from what I hear, you're crazy. You guys talking about the Yankees making the wild cards? They're a game out of first place. I mean, I mean, you know, the the Yankees. You you don't know. There's still a few games left. They can always, you know, get back into that spot. And again, to go on with his point, if you look at the record between the Boston Red Sox and New York Yankees, even though the Yankees are only a game out, they but if you look at it, 
Boston is on a roll. They've won eight out of their last ten. They are on a roll. And New York, Aaron, their Aaron, the Aaron, Aaron Judge, sorry, is not doing well right now. And I just don't see it because Boston has a way better record against them. And I think Boston, like they did <clears throat> last August when New York and Toronto was right behind them, they were able to get that extra jump to take an even more lead. And I, I just think it's going to be Boston in the ALDS, and I think it's going to be Kansas City and New York in the wild card. I just don't see the Yankees getting to be, be in the division. Well, you know, uh, I think that, again, like what I said earlier before, that, you know, playoff time is coming around, and, you know, players are, you know, getting very nervous, and I think that uh, around this time, you you might expect, you know, some downfall in uh, the records. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about um, falling. I mean, yeah, they're four and six. Not every team is going to go 10 and 0, 9 and 1, 8 and 2. It happens. They're four and six. That's not even that bad right now. But regardless, they are in the playoffs, and I think they're going to win. They're definitely going to win. Well, thank you very much for uh, calling. We're going to go on to our next caller. All right. And this guy is from Columbia, Maryland. Sir, you are on the air? Yeah, you are? Yes, you are. All right, thank that's, that's great you. to know. You know what, sir? I would completely 100% agree with you and 100% disagree with you. Yes, the Dodgers are definitely a downfall when it comes to the playoffs. They choke. Clayton Kershaw can't pitch. Puig can't hit. Grandal, they can't work together. But guess what? They had to play either the Nationals or the Giants or the Cubs. This year, they will be hosting the AL Wild Card. Either it's going to be Colorado and Arizona. And if you look at the record versus the NL West, it is tremendously above 500. It's great against the Diamondbacks and the Rockies combined. And even if they make it to the ALCS, and let's say they play the Nationals, they have beaten the Nationals before. So I'm not really concerned. My concern is them being in the World Series against because that's when they haven't been there in a very long time and they're going to feel pressured. But I think they can definitely... Take a step up. If Clayton Kershaw comes through, obviously they just added that new guy, Hill, or who's had a tremendous year. He's like 12-1. and one. He's killing it. And they just added you Darvish. So, you know what? I think they're going to step up, get to the World Series. Don't know about winning it quite yet. Well, thank you very much for calling. Take care. All right. So, um, I think that uh, that's it for our show. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm Noah Jaffe alongside Kate Vitz. And thank you for watch- listening. Sorry, watching. Listening to the CNN show. We'll see you. We'll see you tomorrow night. Take care, everybody. Good call. Two, one. Welcome. It's Thursday morning, and I'm Griffin. I'm here with my partner Philip, and we're ready for our usual Thursday college football show. We're only 23 days away from the kickoff of the season, and I couldn't be more excited. Me neither. Uh, week one matchups are there's some that are intriguing, and then there's the non-conference games that are scheduled to get an easy win. Yeah. Uh, which ones interest you interest you most? Um, of course, the big one, uh, Alabama versus Florida State. I'm looking for Alabama, the bounce back of Bo Scarborough after the broken leg in the championship. How Jalen Hurts has improved his downfield passing, and for um, Florida State, I'm looking for Jer- Derwin James to show. He's a possible Heisman candidate, like a Jabril uh, Pepper style player, and f- to see Florida State takes that next step um, after a poor season last year. Yeah, I'm really intrigued by the West Virginia Virginia Tech matchup. Week one, obviously the Bama Florida State will be the game day. Michigan Florida being played in Dallas, but West Virginia Virginia Tech. I'm interested. I'm interested to see how West Virginia can compete in the Big Twelve this year, and how their offenses will rank against some of the high-powered offenses in that conference: Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, yeah. Baylor. And I'm also interested to see how Virginia Tech's going to do in the ACC. And I think a win like this for either one of these teams would really get them ready going into conference play. Do you have upset you're thinking about? Uh, if I were to pick a week one upset, I do like A&M uh, at UCLA week one. I think uh, Rosen at UCLA is obviously a phenomenal quarterback, but SEC teams have consistently played well against teams out west, and the teams out west don't see defenses like 
the SEC has. And I think that Definitely. Texas A&M obviously had a little bit of a rough season last year, but I think they can get off to a hot start and upset UCLA. Also, I like uh, Florida Atlantic to beat Navy week one. This is going to be a game for Lane Kiffin going in. First game as a coach at Florida Atlantic, and it's going to be a TV game. Uh, he obviously doesn't want to keep this job at Florida Atlantic. This is more of a showcase for him yeah. to get a big-name school. Step and I think a week one game against Navy, a high-powered team, really is a good position for him to be in. I think I'm taking – what some people would think would be a, I'm thinking the major upset. I think BYU will beat LSU week one. I do know Darius Geis is a possible Heisman candidate this year, and he's a very good running back and following first up to Leonard Fournette. But I feel like they don't see teams like BYU very often. LSU does not. BYU, BYU is a very good passing team. They perform well under pressure, especially late in games, and I expect BYU to upset LSU week one. We have a lot to get to here, but first I want to talk about players. Who do you think has the best chance of winning the Heisman Trophy this year? Uh, like I just, I think Darius Geis, I think a running back would probably win it. Darius Geis or Saquon Barkley out of Penn State. I think Geis gives you the power, the one cut, and get downfield. He's a big back, can break tackles, and he, he's fast in space. As you saw at the end of the season, he had multiple 200-yard games, but Leonard Fournette was hurt last year, so he's very capable of running back. Uh, Barkley out of Penn State. All around offensive threat can catch the ball, run the ball, very shifty, kind of like a. I compare him to Le'Veon Bell um, for the Steelers. He's very he has a patient running game, but can get downhill when he needs to. Very shifty, can catch the ball out of the backfield. I look for those two gentlemen to be the top two in the Heisman candidate race. How can you talk about the Heisman and not put Sam Darnold in the conversation? This guy can throw. Last year in the Rose Bowl, he proved to us that he is. Not one of the top, but the top quarterback in the country. And that he is going to be a pro-style quarterback, a high draft pick. And I think USC is probably the closest thing we've seen to a QBU and that he's just going to be another great uh, college quarterback for Southern Cal. I do like the Saquon Barkley pick. I think he's probably the best player in the Big Ten, him or JT Barrett. And I think that he's going to rush for a ton of yards this year. But what I really like is my dark horse, Quentin Flowers. He's a dual-threat quarterback out of the University of South Florida, and I really think that just based off his stats, he's going to have a really good shot at the Heisman, and he'll at least be a finalist. We still have a lot more to get to, including the playoff, but first we're going to go to a radio sports update from Noah Jaffe. Thank you very much, guys. I'm Noah Jaffe. The Phil's taking a big loss last night. Mike Trout, C.J. Cron, and uh, Clay Coward all hitting homers, leading to a 7-0 loss. The Phils are last in the NL East. The Eagles continuing training camp. Alshon Jeffrey still on the sideline with his injury. Their next preseason, ga- their first preseason game is next week. The Philadelphia 76ers w- was voted the best offseason grade. Mar- Markel Fultz very happy, and the Phil- some Philadelphians think that they will be- make the playoffs. That's all for the sports update. I'm Noah Jaffe. Thank you, Noah. We, uh, we want to hear what you have to say. We've given our opinions on the Heisman and on our Week 1 matchups, but we'd like to get a few callers, so you guys are welcome to call in whenever. Uh, looks like we have one now. we got a caller now from Cleveland, Ohio. Hello, what's your name? I just feel like Barkley, he's an all-around player. Um, he... Like I said, he can run. He can run the ball out of the backfield. You saw his versatility in the USC game, catching passes, running the ball. He ran rough shot through that defense. Even though the Penn State lost that game, he had over 200 all-purpose yards. He can. You saw his performance last year in the Big Ten. If he stays healthy, I feel like just he has a versatility and the excitement that he brings to the game and his rushing ability to to be a big player this year. Yeah, I'm going to add on to that. I think there's kind of an attitude that Saquon Barkley has that he's the guy at Penn State. And a lot of people are doubting that Penn State can have an unbelievable season two years in a row. Obviously, last year they took down Ohio State at home, and that was a big win for them, and they got into the Rose Bowl. But the Rose Bowl isn't where they want to be. They want to be in the college football playoff, and a lot of people are doubting that they can do that. Well, we don't know if anyone's going to get injured. We don't know what's going to happen as far as injury goes. Injuries are random in college football, and they happen all the time. Obviously, we can hope that that doesn't happen to a player with so much talent like Saquon Barkley, and if he were to stay healthy, then I think he has a great shot to win the Heisman. All right, thank you. Thank you for calling. 
we want to get into a little more today on college football, and uh, I want to hear postseason. Who's going to be your playoff? We got a call from Bloomfield, New Jersey. Hello, what is your name? Could you repeat that? I'm Peyton. How are you guys? Good. We're doing well. How are you? What do you want to talk about, Peyton? I definitely think that Barkley has a very good chance of winning the Heisman. Like I said, he was my, he's my candidate to win it with the style of play he brings, his rushing ability. And to say Penn State would make the playoff, I don't think it's a stretch. I do think they have the talent and they have, the co- they have a very good coach. They have, um, they have a tough schedule. They play Ohio State, Michigan, and Michigan, Michigan State um, back to back to back. And two of those games are away games. But I think if they can make it through that three-game three slate, I do think they have a good chance of making the playoff. Yeah, if they can put together a season and get to the Big Ten Championship and win, they're obviously going to be right in the playoff. And it's it's not a stretch. I mean, they're preseason five, I think, five or six. And I think the big the biggest test is going to be at Ohio State. Ohio State is going to be angry after last season, really Penn State ruining their season, what it looked like midway through, uh, beating them at home. But now they have to go to Columbus, Ohio, in the shoe, and I think that's going to be a big test for Penn State. Thank you for yeah, calling. Yeah, thank you for calling. I think for my other my playoff schedule, I had just a quick rundown. I had Alabama mainly because they're just they're so they're so dominant. I think if they beat Florida State week one, which I do think they will do, they'll run this they'll run the table in the SEC. My other team was um I had Ohio State. I think that they'll sort of I think they'll lose early to Oklahoma, but run the rest of the game. That'll look great for the committee, especially if they beat Michigan if Michigan's ranked. Uh, Penn State and they play uh, Michigan State this season. Um, I also think the Louisville. I think Louisville will go undefeated this season, win early at Purdue, and run the slate in the ACC. I think they'll beat Clemson and Florida State pretty handily this year. And my last team was, I believe, USC with Sam Darnold leading the pack. I think they'll run the table in the Pac-12 as well. I like I like Alabama. I just think that they've built such a dynasty and they've been in every college football playoff. And I think that. I can agree with you on that. I do like the Ohio State pick and the USC pick, but I have one change. I don't think Louisville can get there, but I actually have a dark horse out of the Big 12 with Oklahoma State. I think Oklahoma State, with Mason Rudolph at quarterback and one of the best receiving crews in the country, can get that final spot. But that's going to be all the time we have today to talk about college football. It was a good Thursday morning. Thank you for listening. With my partner, Philip. I'm Griffin Hill.